Photographers have the power to connect people to a world they may never have a chance to visit. Through this connection, photographers have the unique ability to generate awareness and passion for nature, wildlife and our planet Earth. Nikon Ambassador Ron McGill has worked with and photographed wildlife for over 40 years. He is an internationally recognized zoological authority, award-winning photographer and wildlife preservationist. Ron's photography has inspired an appreciation for wildlife in others and has fostered efforts to ensure that wild animals can always live in the wild. Join Sammy's as we visit with Ron and learn how his photography has inspired others to protect and conserve wildlife. There is no question in my mind, the single greatest tool I have in connecting people to wildlife is photography. You know, as photographers, what we are as storytellers, we've got to be good storytellers. And photography, short of taking someone by their hand and bringing them to the Maasai Mara to experience the migration, bringing them to the Arctic to see polar bears crossing the ice, bringing them to the Amazon to see a jaguar going through the forest, short of being able to do that, showing them an impactful image, a photograph, does more than any words I can convey to them. You know, I can describe an animal, I can, but when I show them the image and they make that connection and look at an image, that's what gets them. That is the greatest single tool I have in engaging people in conservation and wildlife. There's an old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we're taught. Photography helps me teach people about the beauty and importance of wildlife. Just, it's patience. It's, I gotta tell you, other than knowing your model, knowing an animal's behavior, the number one quality you need as a wildlife photographer is patience. Don't go chasing animals around. Find a good spot, wait, and see what happens in front of you. And that's what I did with these cheetahs. You know, I waited outside where I knew there was a den, and I waited there for that, with the mother and the, and, the, and the cubs, I waited there about four hours before they showed up, and I got that. But the other one, with the cheetahs, with the mother, and the four cheetahs around her, that's a very famous cheetah in a place called Kwandwe in South Africa. Cheetahs have a huge mortality rate. It's rare that a cheetah can actually raise one of her offspring to adulthood, to the next generation. They get killed so often by hyenas, lions, everything else. But these guys, that mother, is known for raising her young to adulthood, which is like making her the most incredible mother. And I heard about her, and I flew to South Africa. I said, I gotta find this mother because I heard she had four cubs and they were raised. And we searched two days. At the end of the second day, we found her. The sun is setting, but they're in this very thick bush with all kinds of thick brush. And I said, well, let me just get a picture of her. You know, you get a picture, you take the picture, you go, oh my God, there she is. Okay, beautiful. Oh, great. I got that picture of her. And then all of a sudden, I see the, the cubs were adult size. I go, oh my gosh, I got it. But I was trying to see, is there any way I can get a picture of them together? I said, there's no way. They're in this thick brush. And just as about to give up, she goes up on top of this termite mound. The sun is setting, you got this great golden light. And she looks up and I say, oh gosh, are the cubs gonna follow her? And then the cubs follow her and they're all up there and I get this picture. But the thing was, when I took the first picture, they're all looking in different directions. But I was so happy, you know, but as a photographer, you always want more. You get up there and go, okay, guys, I got this and I'm really thankful that I got all of you in one shot. I could prove that I've seen you, but it would be so great if you're all looking my way. And you don't, again, you know, don't make any noise or anything, you just wait. I waited there, they were on that termite mound for about between half an hour to 45 minutes, just looking around, but always looking in different directions, each one of them. And then all of a sudden, a vulture flew from behind my vehicle and they looked. And I just went, Fah! and that's the shot where you got, one is still looking straight ahead, but the majority of them are looking at me, with, and they're spaced like perfectly, like I took them as models and said, you stay here, you stay here, you stay here. It's one of those things that, you know, it's like winning the jackpot as a photographer. You take this shot and people will look at it and go, oh, that's a pretty shot. But if they knew what it took to get to that picture, they would think, oh my. for me, I've got that blown up big in my house because I remember, I said, I found her, I found her adult to get them in that one moment, you know, where all of a sudden this vulture flies up behind them and they go, oh, what's that? I go, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I probably have 20 pictures of them looking exactly the same way because I want to make sure I got it. And I tend to shoot, when I'm shooting animals, I tend to shoot at aperture priority wide open so I can focus on the animal and the background kind of gets blurred out. It also tends to give me my fastest shutter speed, so I tend to get the sharpest image. But you can play with the light a lot here. You know, you've got those animals over there in the shade um, and all the zebras in the back. Zebras are always great because you've got all those lines. They're so graphic. And the things that I've been very lucky to do. Again, some kid from a Cuban immigrant dad, uh, didn't have a lot to start with. Um, 
my parents did an amazing job of giving my sister and I a tremendous opportunity, but you know, the reality is we, we were not affluent people by any stretch of the imagination. So being able to travel around the world and being able to photograph these animals and document those animals, when I do these presentations, people at universities go, God, you're so excited when you give these presentations and you must have given it a million times. I go, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you give it. When you see the image, it reminds you of when you were there. And that, that for me is just a blessing beyond belief because what I try to get people to understand is this, that, you know, whether it's the coral reefs that protect our shores and filter our oceans, whether it's the Amazonian forest that pr provide the medicines that we use, you know, uh, air that we breathe, uh, you know, whatever it is, it's connected to our quality of life. By protecting wildlife, we're protecting ourselves. The elephants, we teach them certain behaviors so we can better care for them. These are not tricks that we teach them. What we do is, I'll tell her to put her trunk up so that I can see the inside of her mouth. I'll tell her to put her ears out so that we can actually um, get blood from the veins in her ears. She'll actually let us put a needle in a vein so we can collect blood. Uh, we have to trim their toenails. We have to do their pedicures all the time. So she has to be able to present her feet to us. Peggy, foot. Let me see your foot, Peggy. Good girl. Good girl, Peggy. Good girl. That's a good girl, Peggy. That was a bad throw. I'm sorry about that. There are over 40,000 muscles inside the trunk of an elephant. They're incredible animals. The Africans have the big ears. Both the African females and males have the tusks. One of the most intelligent animals in the world. Peggy, speak, speak, speak. Uh, louder, speak, speak. Good girl, Peggy, good girl. That's a good girl, Peggy. Now, Peggy, that's a bad throw. Bad throw, Peggy, here, there you go. We have a moral obligation to preserve this earth, to make it at least as good as it was when we got there, if not better, because it's that future generation that we're passing it on to. They are, they're gonna have ownership. We have to be good stewards. Our obligation is to engage people, to connect people, to make them care. When I started working at the zoo 40 plus years ago, I didn't come to work here to be part of an attraction. I will say something that'll make people kind of look at me weird. I would never ever support taking an animal out of the wild and putting it in captivity. Unless it's a last ditch effort to save that individual's life or a last ditch effort to save the species that it represents. And we've done that. Zoos have done that. The California condor, the Arabian oryx, the black footed ferret. There are several examples where zoos have done that. What people need to realize is all the animals you see here, these animals have all been born under human care. They've not been pulled out of the wild. The knowledge that we can obtain from these animals, we can apply to their wild counterparts and help you know, protect those populations. Having said that, zoos have to do much more than simply keep animals under human care and multi-million dollar exhibits. If we do not put our money where our mouth is to protect the animals we have in captivity in the wild where they belong, then we're nothing more than hypocrites. That's what inspired me to create the Ron McGill Conservation Endowment here years ago. I said, listen, you know, we're spending millions of dollars on these exhibits, but we're not really spending the money in protecting them in the wild. The bottom line is this, if the zoo is the last place you can come to see these animals, then we as institutions have been epic failures in what should be our primary goal, and that is to ensure that these animals always have a place to live in the wild. That's what our goal should be, to educate, inspire people to make sure that that wild habitat is protected. I've had a, a situation in the wild where a leopard actually saw its reflection in my 500 F4 lens, the, the glass, and walked up to it to look at it. And I got this shot literally filling the frame with just his eyes, looking at his reflection in the glass. It's pretty cool, pretty cool frame. Bye bye. Oh, yes. Big joke is because I'm six foot six, they say, you must take care of the giraffe, right? Ha ha ha. It's the first time I heard that one. All right, buddy. Look at this. Peekaboo. This is great. Cool shot. Thank you, girl. I liked it. All right. I think that when people hopefully look at my photography, they see more than just an animal. They see an environment. They see a beauty. They make a connection. That's such an important word, connection. You know, we always hear about the web of life, the chain of life, and it's all connected.
imagine that I would, you know, I've traveled to Africa over 50 times in my life to document this incredible wildlife. His face is so beautiful. Niger, Niger, look here, buddy, Niger. I mean, it's just perfect, it's just beautiful. Hey, I want to take this opportunity to thank my friends at Sammy's for coming out here to Miami to film this wonderful piece out here. Hopefully it inspires you to not only enjoy and appreciate wildlife, but to pick up a camera and create wildlife images of your own. Every day it's something different. They surprise you. The only thing predictable about them is that they're unpredictable. So go to sammys.com, find out all this wonderful equipment that's available to you to inspire you to get out and make memories of your own. We want to thank Ron McGill and Nikon for their help in producing this video. We encourage our viewers to do whatever they can, either through their photography or other efforts to preserve wildlife, this vanishing resource.